We've got about maybe 50 minutes or so to explain in the future. So I'm going to have to leave out some of the details. All right. Let's, um, let's bring the house lights up and take the stage lights off so we don't wash out the screen. See if we can do that. Okay, so notion of what is a real futurist? So Matt said I have a degree in this, but you know, it, it was, I got it back in um, 1981, so it really is in the past. It's all history now. But I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not this. This is me shopping the competition so you don't have to. <laughs> it's not about telling fortunes. It's not about making predictions. Because let's be honest, if I could predict the future, I wouldn't be here. I'd be on my own island. It's more like this. More like a court jester. So a fortune teller tells you absurd things. A court jester ask you absurd questions, but the point is to get you to think. You have to be thinking about the future, and your future, and how you make it. These are the real futurists. It's your members, your leaders, that we get involved in these kinds of things. So I want you to think if you have been a leader, or are a leader, or could be a leader, Think of yourself as a futurist. Then again, maybe not. <laughs> Bruce Sterling, science fiction writer, he said, real futurists have children. And his point was that lots of times a so-called futurist get ideas that start inside of our head and then stay inside of our head and never get challenged by outside reality. How many of you have children? Have your children ever challenged your definition of reality? <laughs> and they do it on a constant basis. And see, it isn't, you know, I've never had children. And I, it, it, everybody has their own story. I feel that is one of my greatest failures, that I didn't do that. Because I know that I would have been much more fierce if I had that connection. And what's happened in our society to a great extent is we are the children we never had. And so many people today never have to grow up because so much of the society says stay young and never ever have to go beyond that. But you really do. You have to go on. You have to make choices. So when I was speaking at NIA Kansas, someone from one of the, the, the native tribes there came up and he said, all right, let's talk about the future. And he kind of thought that maybe I'd focus too much on technology, but I'm talking to architects, so that's kind of why I did it. And he said, in his tribe, they have this thing about thinking about decisions unto the seventh generation. And he was talking to some of his elders about it. And one of the elders said, you don't get it. It's not seven generations forward, but it's seven generations with you in the middle. So it is not ignoring the past, because the past history lingers, and we are a part of it. And to think that we can cut off history without learning any lessons from it is so arrogant. But we've got to be able to think forward and think about not just singular paths, but that you have choices, and there are good choices and bad choices. And if you don't know how to make decisions, and to think about what are the implications of the implications of the implications, you're quite in danger. Richard Sol Worman, he's got created the TED conferences. He said, if you see connections between things, your choices will be less threatening. And we must see those connections. This, these ladies, these beautiful women are part of my past. Paul, Desmond? Yeah. Meet the Desmond girls. They're beautiful. They are. So this is my great-grandmother, her four sisters, my great-great-grandmother. Five of them were redheads. <laughs> and I know hardly anything about them. How quickly we lose connection with the past. And yes, 
you look at these women, and you know they were full of life. And they have stories to tell, and how quickly those stories get forgotten. And we shouldn't forget. There is so much value to hold on to. And we think that, like these devices we hold in our pocket, are futuristic. No. Futuristic is anything which has future value. So this photograph of all the things, and I have four, four brothers, and we all kind of get to choose things that we're going to inherit. This is the only thing I wanted. I wanted that photograph. Because I love them. And I wanted to know them. And are you thinking about the fact that someday, if you are lucky, you will be on a photograph like this, and your great grandchildren, or your great great grandchildren, may look back and they go, hey, this is my great great grandmother. She was an architect. You see, when we don't connect things, we forget about that there actually are connections. And one of the things we've done in our society, because we have so much power, we've been able to do so much, that this has become a truth. Everything is possible. And you think, that's what we want. We wanted to have all these possibilities. We've thrown off the chains of history, and we can be free to do more things and be more. And yeah, that's good. But if you think about this truly, deeply, the notion of everything is possible should scare the hell out of you. How do we choose? And there are bad choices, and there are bad things, and we must work to prevent them. Stuart Brand, he's a writer, and he says, in terms of all this technology, in terms of all the things that we are doing, we are becoming like gods. So we've got to get good at it. And the question is, how's that working for you so far? We are not gods. And we must not ever think that we are. We will fail if we even attempt that. And so you have to have deep, deep roots. Because if everything is possible, we will be seduced. And so you better have a foundation that you cannot be pushed off of. So let's talk about toys and tools. And the question is, what are these things? Think about this. We've got these devices. How many of you have a smartphone? Almost all of you. Think about our relationship with them. We cradle them. We gaze into them. We talk to them. We listen to them. We stroke them. There's just two words missing to explain this. My precious. <laughs> I do think I'm kidding. What do these things do to us? Are they seducing us? Is our attention being sucked into those? Are we gazing into the abyss to the point that eventually the abyss stares back? When you consume the internet, do you understand that it is also consuming you? And what is lost? And so both Christian Solterra and, and um, Antoine Pridot talked about drawing and about this simple tool. And please understand, you know, I've never wanted to be an architect, but I've always admired them. And the one talent that I am particularly jealous of is your ability to draw. It's amazing. And if you don't do that, if you lose that, if that isn't a constant within you, I love when Christian said that, you know, about all those hours that you put into drawing, that eventually your hand knows things that you do not. That's brilliant. And it is something that you must have in your occupation that you carry forward. But think about, like, Google is bringing out Google Glass this next, well, starting the year that starts tonight. $1,500, and it's going to be able to project in front of you 
augmented reality images. And the potential is that you could look at somebody and essentially Google them, pull up information about them. Imagine what you could do with this in a bar. <laughs> or being able to walk up to a building and see materials and spec it and find out where that doorknob came from or where the carpet is and how much it costs. And maybe even be able to walk into a building and see what the square footage costs just through your glasses. Would you need other people? Where will this take us? Will we be seduced into not needing each other? Because we always have that, like we always have these. They said these things were going to allow us to communicate with anybody. And quite often what happens is we communicate with ourselves. They're not tools of connection, they're tools of disconnection. And what it is, is it's what's called hyper-living. We're skimming along the surface of life, and the goal is not to enjoy what you're doing, but to simply finish what you're doing so you can go to the next thing is waiting for you. And there is this issue of seduction, of the technology pulling us in. And, and one of the issues that we really have to face is this notion of the spoils go to the distractors. There's a battle for your attention. And the average American encounters three to 5,000 advertising messages a day, which at some level is grabbing a little bit of your attention. Your attention is the most valuable resource you own. You're not able to protect it. You're losing something. And the question is, who are you losing it to? Why is your attention being seduced? Who's gaining? Who's losing? And then we have logistics, which is sort of the other side of, you know, it's becoming the age of design, but it's also becoming the age of logistics. And of course, architecture is the combination of sort of artistry and logistics. It's measurement and art. And so you're at the center of where these two things are coming into the center. But logistics is all about how do we measure things. So these things here are what's called smart dust, little smart RFID tags that can communicate. That's a human hair going through the photograph. These things are powder sized. You could put them anywhere. So why not put them into the buildings so that you can get all this measurement going? And so the pipe can talk to you. The parts can talk to you. You put things together wrong, they can speak up. Everything can be measured. How does that change the way you relate to materials? How does it relate to the notion of who's in charge? And what can these buildings say? There's this issue of all this information in these buildings. And there are plans where people are looking at taking these little quadcopters, these little flying machines, and putting cameras and sensors on them, and having them fly through the buildings and measure everything and fly outside the buildings looking for everything from heat loss to whatever it is that they can measure. And so think about, like, for instance, all the data that we've gathered together to create the GPS systems. You can travel anywhere to any point and not get lost. In between all those roads are all these buildings. What's the value of that? It's an interesting question that is emerging of people looking at all the data out there. And we're just beginning to scratch the surface. Yeah. So you know the term big data? It's that all this data out there of all our behavior becomes measurable. And so like you've seen, like you've probably seen on Facebook where people would put up this statement on their Facebook page saying, oh, I, can, I own the copyright and all this stuff. And, and then other people are going, yeah, that's nonsense. And then people put up this notion of, here's the privacy policy for Facebook. If it's private, don't put it on Facebook. You need to understand with big data and all the things that are being able, they're, they're gathering is, you have no concept of privacy. That they can determine from very simple things, very simple actions, 
from everything from monitoring what you're searching for to who you get emails from and what's in your email, they can know exactly what you're thinking. They can know who you're going to vote for. And what does that do to a sense of a free society when it becomes predictable? Milton Friedman, the economist, said the power to do good is also the power to do harm. And we must be very, very aware. Because what I hear constantly when I'm talking to architectural students and architects is they want to change the world. And it's one of the great ambitions is to make the world a better place. And then, of course, the question is, based on what? What are you basing your choice, your decision of saying, this is going to be better? And how do you make sure that all your little efforts don't amount into something that can be catastrophically bad? What do you base your choices on? You think it's good, but most, most of the time when we've had people in the past in history who we now judge as evil, they thought they were doing good. That's interesting. Re reality and reality. Tommy saw an Avatar. Okay. How many felt suicidal after watching it? Seriously, there's, you can, you, there's, there's uh, a term, Avatar Depression Syndrome, where they find that people who went to this fascinating movie with, with this great alternate reality, and you wanted to be there, and the movie ended, and you walked outside and went, this world sucks. Think of how real we're making it. How many of you have seen World Builder? Okay, great. I showed this last year. I'm going to just show it just a little bit here. It's done by a friend of mine, Bruce Brandon. But it's his idea of the, a future architect who builds inside of sort of a 3D environment. He recreates a little Italian village. And is this the future of architecture? Where we build this stuff and it seems real. And we're drawn in. And our attention goes in there. When does it have to be real? And when can it be someplace your attention goes? And you can just lay in bed, sit in the chair. Find it online if you haven't seen it. World Builder Records, right? Brandon. There is a distinct possibility that we're going to have him come and speak at convention in the uh, Architect Lab connected to the Emerging Professionals uh, Center that we're putting together. How many of you have seen this movie? Psych, okay, it's about, not, it's about seven minutes long, it's online, it's done by some Israeli design students as their senior project, I believe. So it's about contact lenses. So it's taking the concept of Google Glass and taking it much farther. And it's about augmented reality, not, not necessarily replacing it, but overlaying information. So you have him sitting here in his living room, but what he's seeing, he's playing a game. And everything gets gamified so they can win points. <coughs> and that becomes a very seductive thing. He's hungry, goes to the fridge, opens it up, and through his glasses, he knows the nutritional value of all the stuff in the fridge. He pulls out cucumbers, and of course everything's gamified, so according to how well he slices these things, and every time he makes a slice, it goes, good job, way to go. <laughs> this is what he sees on his walls. So it's, it's making the world a computer screen, and everything just get, gets overlaid because that's what he's seeing through his lenses. He's reminded he has a date tonight, and of course it also gives him more points the better dressed he is. So he meets Daphne Wilson at the bar, and so he's got, pulling up her information from the equivalent of Facebook or whatever it would be. But then, she's, she's had some drinks here, she's getting a little glassy-eyed, but she brings up something that's uncomfortable. He works for the company that makes the lenses, and there's some questions about it. So he's got an app he pulled up called Wingman. And it tells him, it gives him instructions on how to 
have a better date. He manages to convince her to come home. She sees art and fun stuff. And then she sees his Wayne Manhole wall of fame right there. She gets upset. She tells him, tells him he's a freak. She walks out. As she's walking out, he reboots her lenses. This is fiction. But the question is, how real could it be? And if we have these lenses, at one point she's talking about how she has the lenses and the lenses crashed, and she couldn't see anything, and she was just totally lost. And would we get to a point where we are so used to these things? Think about how often you touch or use these your, your smartphone, and what if you're wearing them? And how would it change the way we interact? Marshall McLuhan said, first we shape our tools, then our tools shape us. How much of us is going into these devices? We're not always impressed with reality. So this is Katrina, and we don't like it, so we look away. about realty. You notice the blank environment. If I can bring my art with me, if I can project things, what happens to interiors, what happens to exteriors, what happens to building facades? And is that what, is that challenging? Is, is one of your major competitors in the future going to be graphic designers? Or gamers? G.K. Chesterton, writer, English, said, we are learning to do a great many clever things. The ne next great task will be to learn not to do them. Revolution. Do you understand that we're heading towards some very interesting times in terms of the kind of work you're doing, the kind of work you won't be able to do? Two books. Chris Anderson. He used to be the editor of Wired Magazine, I believe, wrote a book called Makers, The New Industrial Revolution. Ro Khanna wrote a book called Entrepreneurial Nation. Please, please understand that you better learn to be much more entrepreneurial. The notion of starting your own businesses, or at least recognizing the biggest mistake you'll ever make in your life is to believe that you work for somebody else. But you have to have this sense of self-employment and taking care of your own careers. But we may have to do this because, you know, you live in a country where they've been telling you for years, we've got all these things that are too big to fail. You know what that's also saying? There are so many other things that are too small to succeed. And please understand, the notion that something is too big to fail is a lie. Rome fell. If Rome fell, we can too. Nothing is too big to fail. But it's also this notion of industrial revolt. And you've got these maker spaces where people are learning to use machines. Please understand, you may have to learn to not only get your hands dirty, but you're going to get dirt under the fingernails. And you're going to bruise your hands. Band-aids are for the brain. And we have to maybe rethink how, what kind of an economy will we be able to create as we move forward. And it may mean that you have to stay up late at night, not simply in studio, but when you are out there on your own, that you may have to invent the future. It isn't going to come to you. You may have to go to it. I crossed out printing and put printers, not the machines, but you, that I think 3D printing is going to be a huge factor in how the world is made. It may bring back factories to the United States, and not just simply back into cities, but into neighborhoods, and even into your own homes. But 3D printing is advancing so fast, and we were able to print, not simply with ABS plastic, gold, titanium, rubber, plastic, all sorts of things. This may be how we re recreate things in the future. Human mandibles are already being used. <coughs> this little girl here has a, a genetic condition. She didn't have the strength to lift her own arms. So they printed her an exoskeleton with rubber bands. And you see a photograph here. It's her hugging her mother for, her, for the first time. This is kind of good stuff. And what about the idea of printing houses? 
Is this possible? And if you think that it's not possible, here's the thing, here's one of the tricks of being a futurist. Anytime you say, is this possible? And someone says no, then you have to ask, well, what would have to change so it could be possible? You don't get to say, no, it can't happen anymore. And we have got, we've gotten so innovative, so creative. Nothing stands in our way. Everything is possible. So I went to a, a little two-day convention out at AIA, uh, the Center for Architecture in, in, in New York City. And Scott Summit, who works for 3D Systems, he had a company called Bespoke. And he made 3D printed prosthetic limbs. But as a designer, he worked with the individuals. These were not commodities that came off in sets. Worked with each individual. And so this woman has one where the outside casing is lace. They did another one for another woman where the, um, the outside had, it matched her purse. Some of the guys that they work with they recreated the tattoos that had been on the leg they lost and put it onto the artificial limb, but personalizing it. And he said that their major clients were people who had been injured in motorcycle accidents. Those people take risks. They were with them, but you know, in terms of let's try something new, let's, let's push the boundaries, let's push the edge. So Scott and others spoke at this conference, Bits and Mortar, and it was a two-day conference all about how do we redefine architecture? So this designer, Scott Summit, is talking architects because Scott doesn't think there's a boundary between the design fields. Chris Anderson in his book said, returning to an age of making things requires not industrial arts, but teaching design. Nanotechnology, that's actually my brother there. He's a nanotechnologist. In my family, I'm not the one with the weird career. The old style inventiveness, and, and just the notion of, you know, how to make and use electricity. There was these, this old industrial mindset where people were exploring and trying new things, and we need to bring that back. Robert Ivey said yesterday, design teaches you to see what others are not able to get to see. You have that ability. And your ability as designers to see things means that you have to help us, the rest of us, see what is possible in terms of helping to make and design a better future. I was at a conference where uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Idaho spoke, and he said, what are things different about America? He said, here, small ideas are as important as big, as big ideas. Yes, please. Small ideas. What is the big idea for your generation? Is it to save the world or is it to save individual parts of it and work whatever, with whatever is in front of you? Start small and early. Not too far, too late. What's right in front of you? Small ideas. A generation of small ideas may be the big idea for your generation. And Here's one of the other things. Failure is going to be a part of it. An awful lot of ideas fail. And we have become so afraid of failure that we are in danger of all failing. There's a book called 50 Dangerous Things You Should Let Your Kids Do. And one of them is super glue your fingers together. Another one is to play with fire. How many of you have played with fire? Can you imagine not playing with fire? <laughs> it's in our nature. But we're so afraid. It's okay sometimes to get burned. It's okay sometimes to take the heat. Small and important. And I always like to somehow connect some of these things to children. Because as they say, they're our future, right? So here's one of the things about the technology you're working with, is that, as, Mark, as, as Winston Churchill said, first we shape our buildings, then our buildings shape us. 
Marshall Keynes said, first we shape our tools, then our tools shape us. And are we ending up with so many buildings looking like technical drawings? And I found this marvelous tweet from a woman by the name of Melissa Pierce. She's a filmmaker in Chicago. She said, so many new buildings look cold and unromantic, boxy without curves, starting to believe that architects had mothers that never loved them. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, this is an important issue. The issue of love and what we love. Do we love our tools? Do we love people? And how do we take these tools particularly these pencils, and interact with the drawings to bring something that's lost. In Milwaukee, where I live, there's this, this school called Emmanuel Phillip Elementary. It was finished in 1931, and it's a, it's a storybook school. Mankato sandstone, release carved railings that are child height to walk up to the school, how the elf got its trunk, wrapping the school these terracotta panels of Mother Goose themes. Penguins guarding the balustrade there. You go into the school, there's two, there's two kindergarten rooms. This was built for a poor German immigrant neighborhood. Germans invented kindergarten. In the first kindergarten, you look at the floor carefully, you see panels, you lift the panels to find a sandbox. You go into the other kindergarten room. There's a fireplace right near the door, and farther on, there's a fountain. And I was told by people who had gone there years ago, the teacher would sit in a rocking chair in front of the fire, and the little kids would sit around her, and she would read to them. But of course, the school is now closed. It's out of date, it's inefficient. It doesn't match modern standards. If this, those elements, you know, the interiors, quite often in the schools today, are marvelous. But is there anything outside of the school, on the facade, that invites a child in, that tells the child there's something fun and special, a garden of learning in here? So last year with the board, we went on a boat tour of architecture in Chicago. And we're going past Jeannie Gang's aqua tower. And the tour guide said, my little girl, my little seven-year-old, has said she was going to run away and go live there. <laughs> and she told this boat of architects, she goes, that's great architecture if a little child would leave her mother in place. <laughs> <laughs> and so my challenge to you as someone who is not an architect, but greatly admires architecture and architects, can you design a school or an office building or any kind of building that a little child would look up and go, wow, and I don't care how old the child is. I want an 80-year-old child to go, Okay, here's one of the key takeaways. Your philosophy matters more than your plans. In the sense that this is what is holding up your plans. This is what you build your plans upon. And we are not trained. We are not prepared. So when I, I participated in a crit at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, And they had this thing about the sky, sky car city. And it was all about changing the world and changing these people's lives and getting rid of cars and, and having this, this marvelous new city. And when it was my turn, I said, how many of you have ever taken any philosophy or theology? And the response was laughter. That was not a good answer. You need that. If you are going to change the world and you do not have any foundation of philosophy or theology, you're doing it wrong. 
and we must connect the past with the future. So, this is my little niece, Rachel. In the photo here, she's one year old. This is my grandma, her great-grandmother. And my grandma there was 99 and a half. So what you're seeing in one family is 98 years of distance and separation, and obviously no distance and no separation. And sometimes the way you best look at the future is when you're holding it in your arms. Children really are the message we send to the future. What are we trying to say? What are we failing to say? And then this is my grandfather. <laughs> and a couple things you need to know. Number one, he did not drink. <laughs> and number two, he did not wear the bowling ball bag most of the time. <laughs> number three, he had several patents to his name for tools he made for the automobile industry. Very smart guy, but only went to eighth grade. The fourth thing is, I miss him. The past goes away. And if you are not reaching out to your past that may go any day, you never know when the past goes away. So you must reach out and you must try to learn and embrace and take it with you. Take the value with you. It isn't the, the stuff that's futuristic. It isn't the things in our pockets. It's the things in our hearts things in our souls that give us the reason to live and to work and to play and to love. So let's talk about philosophy, talking about foundations. What do we build upon? And it must be a very clear thing for you that you have to be able to transfer all this great talent that you have. I tell non-architectural audiences that architecture is one of the occupations that is best prepared to lead the rest of the world into the future. Because you are the paradox, you are art and science, you are form and function, beauty and strength. It's all those things. You have that training, but you have to be able to transfer it and connect it to the rest of the world. If you don't understand that your training goes far beyond buildings, building all that you can. Because if you don't have a foundation, things fall down or can get taken away. And think about this. The challenges we are facing because of all <coughs> these things that are possible, we need far deeper foundations than we have ever needed before. Deep, deep foundations that connect us so deep into the ground that when we know why we're here and we know what we can do, we can do it. We have a place to stand so we can move the world. If you don't have a foundation, you can't move it and you will lose it. So we talk about the notion of revolution, but, but, but the possibility of renaissance, of all these things coming together and we've got all this new data and all this new technology. But renaissance is the goal. It is rebirth, it is reinvention, it is reimagination. It is recreation. And it is your future. It is your renaissance to make. Or the alternative is, ladies and gentlemen, that architecture and get turned into a hodgepodge of 99 cent ads. And nobody cares. And it will be done by engineers who do not have the creative sense. They have great technical talent, that's great. But you are the ones that have the creative talent. And you must be able to defend the value of design, to defend and explain the value of beauty. So you've got to be articulate. You've got, that's why. Shelley Potter and Diane Jacobs and I did the presentation on presentation skills because that becomes an essential skill for the future of architects. You must be able to articulate why it is you are an architect. Why does architecture have value for the world that we need to build? If you cannot articulate it, if you cannot be 
eloquent and elegant as your buildings are, it won't matter because we'll all be distracted and thinking about something else. We've got these choices. And there's all this past that's standing in the way. And the question is, what do we hold on to? And what do we let slip? Understand this. If you let things fall through your hands, if you let the past fall through your hands, if we let it go, you will never, ever be able to pick it up again. This time has these choices. And I'm sorry that this is the choice you have, but it is your time. So there's this old Latin phrase. I first heard Harvey Gant, the mayor of Charlotte. Thank you. I'll be speaking there. February 1st. Yeah, I'm sure. He said, nothing about us without us is for us. And it is a marvelous notion of, of design. And here's, here's, a, here's an important point to make. We're now in an age where customers are co-workers. This dividing line that, that separated us is gone. And George Bernard Shaw, the writer, said, all professions are a conspiracy against the laity. Well, you need to be able to reach across that aisle and pull people in and help them understand what is the value of design. So we have all this emphasis, well, we need to educate our workers. No, we need to educate everybody. Everybody has to learn about design. It's how the future is going to work. The old things we built with, that weren't done with others, but done to them, that didn't work. And all this future stuff, if we do it without their involvement, if we toss our plans upon people and say, well, I'm an architect, I'm smarter than you, I've got the answers, that will not work. So, you may have seen, there's an article I wrote in Design Intelligence called, Maybe the Future's Just Not That Into You. And the point is, you're obsessing about the future, and it's all about preparation, and all about, you know, sort of, it's like this magical date. You know you're going to be perfect together, but in fact, the future doesn't even know you exist. And the future's got its own issues, its own people. You need to pay attention to what's right in front of you. And yes, prepare, but you've got to be living and you've got to be engaged in the day, in the time. But there's possibilities. The, the job market may not get better. And you may have to think about what are you going to do. Nicholas Negroponte was speaking at the uh, that Worth Bits and Mortar thing. He said, architecture school. He went to architecture school, graduated, but did not become an architect. He said, architecture school teaches you to see in multiple point perspective. And it is this notion of being able to not think outside the box. Because that's nonsense. You're thinking outside the box, you're wandering around lost in thought. Think into other boxes. How can you take your thinking and move it into other arenas? What is the value of architecture in education, in medicine? in botany, in retail. Think into other boxes. That's your great opportunity. And there is a website, it's a Tumblr page, created by an architect by the name of Maya Small. I believe she's in Providence. And she's, every day she's adding a new picture of people who trained as architects or studied architecture, as in architectural history. So like Mar Martha Stewart, she studied architectural history. Ice T, um, George Takai. I gave a big one to Weird Al Yankovic, because he's kind of, you know, soul brother of some sort or something other. Brad Pitt. So these people trained as architects, and they're not architects. Are they losers? Or are they potentially the greatest allies this field has ever seen? And how do we connect with them? How do we Connect, and, you know, and yes, they're not architects, so technically we can't call them architects, but that horse left, left the building a long time ago. You, you know, you search online, term architect, 
What comes up first? Ted Mosby. It, 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 it's systems architecture. <laughs> systems design. So if you, you know, if you don't become an architect, how are you going to take that mindset that you still have all this training for and connect it to something else and then connect it back to us? So last couple of years I did this survey of, of AIS students and I asked the question, if you don't become an architect, what else might you become? And then I did a word cloud out of it where I took all the answers and put them into this Wordle app and then the more the word was used, the bigger the word shows up. And it didn't jump out at me there. <laughs> Here's the thing. You understand that the world of design is greater than the world of architecture. It doesn't mean that architecture is not important. It does mean that you're part of a much bigger world and the boundaries on design of all the fields of design are blurring because of the technology, because of the, of the flexibility of job choice today. You're designers. Think big, think broad, think of the whole <coughs> world as a design as your oyster. Mr. Barstow has this great line where he raises his hand and said, I'll do that if you let me. You have to speak up. You are the voice of where the future of the world of design, the world of architecture is going. You need to be able to raise your hand and say, I'll do that if you let me. What are you going to do? What are you going to do about the world of design? What are you going to do about the boundaries that are falling, the boundaries that are rising? So, I have deep Catholic roots. That's my theology. That's the stuff that I love. And it's not on the surface as much as it is in the heart. And it's, the, it's the thing that I stand upon. It's the thing that helps me formulate my thought. And there's this marvelous old phrase called amor fati. And it is to love your fate. And it isn't a sense of fate of that's what's going to happen to you. But whatever happens to you, you embrace it. You love whatever is in front of you and whatever is your life because it is your life. And it's the only one you've got. Do you ever hear the phrase, be yourself, it's not like you got a choice? Love your situation. Love your choices, as difficult as they are. It's your choice. It's your time. Love it. Change it. Make it whatever you want. But don't say, well, it's too difficult. Or I don't want that. And I turn away. We're not meant for safety. We're not meant for security. We're meant to fight the good fight. And sometimes you don't know what the fight is. And you've been, you've been spending these hours and hours in studio. And do you recognize the distinct possibility that your very first assignment in your education hasn't even happened yet. It is to build your own future. It is to save the future. It is to do good things. And this is a battle that's fascinating. And I personally hope every person in here becomes a licensed architect. Because that's going to open so many doors. But my concern is that in the pursuit of license, you lose the amateur. And the, you know, the thing that I also love about architects is you have passion. You went into this field not because you could, because you had to. It's like a magnet that pulls you. It's what wakes you up in the morning and what keeps you awake at night. That's rare. Not all that many people have the passion. That's what Mindy was talking about yesterday. It's, all these people say they want to be an architect, but you did the work. You stayed up, you fought, and you achieved. And that's good stuff. That says you have the strength to do the things that need to be done. Now we move beyond this. Don't forget the amateur in you, the notion of ama, Latin. It means love. 
Don't ever forget, and don't ever forget the love when you were a child and you started playing with things. If you lose that, what you're doing is retiring in place and it just may take 20 or 30 years. Please, go retire someplace else. Stop bothering us, because we've got work to do. So we're working on this thing called a repositioning study. And we've got the study finished, and now we're starting to roll it out. And we're exploring, and we did this funny little bad that had AIA, and then you, you tilted it, and then it went from I to we. And the point is, that they were talking about the notion, that sort of the essential message is that architects help design a better world. That is our assignment. But we cannot do it without you. This thing right here, you are a part of this. You are a part of us. You are a part of the AIA. And please, please join us, because we cannot do it without you. This is exciting. This has potential. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. We need you. We need you to join. We need you to be a part of this and help us, because we cannot do it alone. The notion of catalysts. And catalysts cause heat. And you're going to take heat. And this is going to be difficult. And it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a struggle. There's going to be fights. And we're going to lose people. We're going to gain people. But the whole point of taking the heat is you have a legitimate reason for being cool then. And architects are cool. <laughs> My God, they are. I knew you figured Star Trek was going to show up in here someplace. So, in the movie Star Trek Generations, Picard is trying to pull Kirk out of retirement because he needs him to help him. So, Kirk to Picard, he says, I suppose the situation is grim and things are hopeless. And Picard says, you could say that. And then Kirk says, well, if Spock were here, he would say that I was sort of an irrational, emotional human to go on this assignment. And he looks at Picard and goes, sounds like fun. And that's what battles are, if they're the right battles. If we are fighting the good fight and fighting for the things that have permanent value. This isn't about protecting the little issues within architecture. It's about protecting the whole thing and protecting the foundation of this occupation. Take the heat for that. We have become so scientific, so rational, that we've lost enchantment. And we have buildings that are boxy without curves and unromantic. And I want to see buildings that have a little bit of whimsy and charm. And I want to see design that is creative and has little children looking up in awe. One of the things that G.K. Chesterton said, he said, fairy tales are important for children to hear. Not because they teach children that dragons exist. Because every child knows that dragons exist. The purpose of a fairy tale is to teach the children that the dragons can be defeated. There are dragons out there. And they may not have scales and tails, but maybe they now have three-piece suits and lawsuits and all those other frightening things where we become too afraid and we say, no, make it go away. I'm just going to go off in my little corner here. Fairy tales are important. Enchantment is important. To realize that the world is much bigger than what we see. It is also what we feel. It's what we know to be true, even though we have no evidence of it. That is what makes life rich. And that is what makes architecture and architects able to do and imagine and create things that will have people for generations looking up and going, wow, is that cool? <laughs> <laughs>